In 2008, there was a joint study done by students from both Stanford and from the California Institute of Technology. And the study was interesting because it was one of the first times that an fMRI machine was used to show the activity in a subject's brain while that subject was drinking wine. I think we can all agree that this was a massive step forward for science. So essentially, these test subjects would lay down in this giant magnetic resonance imaging machine, and there was a tube that was tucked into their mouths, and they would be fed different wines through that tube. So this machine would scan their brain and see which regions of their brain were most active and how active they were as they tasted these wines. And as they received each sample through this little tube, they were told the price of the wine in question. And in this particular study, the wines ranged between $5 and $45 per bottle. So relatively cheap wine compared to relatively expensive wine. Relatively expensive for the casual consumer of wines, at least. When asked by the researchers which wines they enjoyed the most, Fairly universally, the test subjects concluded that they enjoyed the more expensive wines. And their brain scans seemed to back up this assertion. There was actually a great deal more activity in their prefrontal cortex, in particular their orbitofrontal cortex, which is the name of the part of the prefrontal cortex right above the eye orbit. And this part of the brain is associated with emotion and decision-making. And so there was more activity in the orbitofrontal cortex when they were drinking the more expensive wine. But the trick here, unbeknownst to the test subjects, was that some of the wines they were given and told were more expensive were actually the same as the wines they were given at the lower price point. And they told the researchers that they enjoyed it more when they believed that it cost more. But on top of that, the fMRI scans showed that they actually did, on a neurological level, enjoy it more. They weren't just saying that they enjoyed it more to try to seem sophisticated. They actually did physiologically enjoy what they perceived to be the more expensive wine to a greater degree. And this is massively interesting to me on multiple levels. My background is actually in branding. and. This is an example, this and other research that has been done in this same vein, sometimes almost exactly the same experiment done and redone, and sometimes some variation on this. But the idea that you can actually increase the quality of something by increasing the perception of how valuable it is, by making somebody believe that the price tag indicates that it is of higher quality, and your body responds in accordance with that, or perhaps a label or a brand name or a logo that is slapped on a particular product will perhaps increase the amount of joy, the measurable quantity of joy and or value that it brings into the purchaser's life. What's particularly interesting about this, though, beyond the branding interest that I have from a professional level, is that the prefrontal cortex is, as far as we know, as far as we can understand, the part of the brain that makes us, quote-unquote, civilized. We are rewarded by this part of the brain when we make choices that more closely align us with what would often be construed as civilized behavior. So when we don't act out, when we are not noticed in a negative fashion, when we don't piss other people off, and damage with the prefrontal cortex, and in particular the orbitofrontal cortex, this part that they were focusing on for the purposes of this particular experiment, damage with that region has been associated with disinhibition issues, which is to say a lack of understanding about social faux pas, a propensity for excessive cursing and compulsive gambling and excessive drinking and smoking, a poor ability to empathize, And so all of these things that we think of when we think of modern human society, things that allow us to be peaceful and allow us to relate well with one another, 
these things are somehow connected to this region. And this region of the brain is very active when we are indulging in something that we perceive to be more expensive. There are different experiments that have been done focused on very different things that have used fMRI machines to scan the brain while test subjects perform different tasks or go through different routines. And as a result of these different experiments, this region has been strongly connected with other so-called stimulus reward value gauging behaviors. And included under that header are things like receiving a smile from a stranger or seeing somebody that we consider to be attractive according to whatever the standard societal average is for attractiveness from wherever we come from. And receiving a smile from somebody that we consider to be attractive, even more so, we are rewarded by this part of the brain in that same way. And so to tie it all together, the orbitofrontal cortex is part of the prefrontal cortex and is part of a sequence of different portions of our brain and different activity centers around our body that are triggered when we do something that is to the social benefit. And it is thought then that this region developed as a competitive advantage because it allowed us to work well together and perhaps even allowed us, once we created these societies that we live in and that we flourish in, it allowed us to compete better within these societies. And so there's a chance that people who have more activity in these areas are people who have certain advantages when it comes to socializing, when it comes to empathizing, when it comes to understanding other people's motivations, when it comes to being physiologically rewarded for doing the quote-unquote right thing within a social setting. This is the part of the brain that seems to cause us to want to be appreciated, that seems to reward us in some way for being the recipient of a smile, and particularly for being the recipient of a smile from somebody that we consider to be attractive. And this is also the part of the brain that seems to reward us in some way for acquiring things or doing things that we consider to be status symbols, including things like drinking more expensive wine. One of the benefits of living today, living in the future the way that we do, is that we are increasingly capable of conducting experiments of this sort, of being able to put a measurable value on things that were once simply perception-based. We believed that we enjoyed the more expensive wine or the more expensive meal or the more expensive hotel or more, but we couldn't say for sure why, and we couldn't say for sure that it was actually happening in any real way. There was a chance that we were just being tricked. There was a chance that there was no reward at all, other than perhaps some fake one that we ginned up afterwards to make ourselves feel better about spending so much money. But today we're becoming increasingly capable of looking at our biases and looking at the perception that guides them, and not just being aware of them, but also being able to use that awareness to help us make better decisions in the future. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This episode is brought to you by HostGator. Whether you're looking to build your first blog or wanting to build a nice professional website for your business, HostGator has a plan that will be right for you. Go to HostGator.com LKT to receive a substantial discount on whatever plan you might be considering. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. Audible has a massive library full of awesome things worth listening to. A bunch of my books are on there, but I will also make a book recommendation, actually two book recommendations at the end of this episode, so stay tuned. If you want to get one of these books for free through Audible, all you have to do is go to audibletrial.com LKT to get a free month-long trial and a free audiobook of your choice. Thanks, as always, for your support. Now let's get back to talking about bias and perception.
Imagine that you're in an art gallery and you're walking through looking at the various different pieces of artwork, the sculptures and the paintings. And one of these paintings in particular catches your eye. You stand there for several minutes taking it all in. And you don't maybe necessarily love art, but this is something that has gripped you. This is something that has resonated with you in some way. This is something that you finally recognize as art. And even though the other pieces throughout the gallery are clearly artworks as well, this is something that goes a little bit deeper. This is something that has caused you to feel something and has communicated something very deep to you. Now imagine yourself in that position. You've got this piece of art that's really resonating with you. And then imagine asking for some details about the artwork and being told that the artist who created it is a mass murderer who is currently incarcerated. How might that change your perception of the artwork? How might that change your perception of art in general? How might it make you feel that this piece that seemed to resonate with you, was created by somebody who, as far as you know, sounds like a truly horrible human being. This is not uncommon, actually. There, there haven't been any studies done on this, as far as I know. But I have heard, in an anecdotal way, many different stories of people who have come across pieces of art that they've really enjoyed, only to find out that it is so-called outsider art. And outsider art is a large term that encompasses art that's created by people who are in prison, people who are in mental hospitals, in some cases people who are neuro-non-typical in some other way. Sometimes it's created by children, or sometimes it's just created by people who are completely outside of the artistic world. They have no training, no relevant background, and they just start creating. And they start to create this work that really resonates with certain people. Former President of the United States George W. Bush has been doing a lot of painting since he left office, and you could get away with calling him an outsider artist. How might your opinion of that piece change if you found out that he made it? And how might your opinion change if you find out that it was created by somebody who has been in the art world for decades? They went to school for painting, and then they got their master's in painting, and then taught painting. And so they've been in that world for a very long time. All of these different potentialities could impact your view of that work. If you come to learn that a piece of artwork was created by an outsider artist, you might assume that something really interesting about it that you really appreciated was done by accident rather than intentionally. You might assume that something that they did that was, seemed innovative was actually done by mistake rather than being an intentional statement. You might flatten some of the depth, some of the roundness that you observed before. There was something about this piece that really gripped you, something that seemed very deep and meaningful about it. And finding out that the artist is not who you suspected they might be, who you assumed they would be could change that assumption. It could change your assumption about there being depth and instead flatten the piece so that all of the interesting bits seem not quite so interesting. They seem like mistakes instead. Our perception of something changes how we experience it. This is a simple idea and it's really pretty obvious, but it's something that I think we very often forget, particularly in situ. When we're in a situation where this matters, where our opinion of something is being directly influenced by our perception of it, we tend to forget that that's happening. And instead, we tend to assume that whatever conclusion we come to is probably the objective reality as opposed to the subjectively warped view of reality predicated on this information that we have, predicated on this bias that we have. There was a piece in The Guardian recently about the Baltimore Police Department, and they've been coming under fire because they essentially adopted a type of surveillance that they didn't tell anybody about. And this surveillance allowed them to take ultra-high-resolution snapshots of the city from above. 
So they could essentially create like a Google Earth type of view of the city and zoom in really close to individual people while also being able to rewind and fast forward and see that view over a period of time. And this is something that conceivably could be a really amazing technology, something that would conceivably allow you to go back in time and trace the complete path of somebody who committed a crime. It would allow you to check out hotspots before they simmer and turn into crimes. It would allow you to keep an eye out even on things like traffic and seeing where cars are backing up so that then perhaps over time you could make changes so that traffic isn't so bad and so that there's not so many accidents, not so many people hitting pedestrians. There's a lot of potential for this type of surveillance technology. And frankly, persistent surveillance of this sort, it it happens all the time already. This is not something that's brand new. This is not something that we don't already have to varying degrees throughout American cities. But the intentional creation of something like this, this overhead view, this Google Earth with TiVo, it catches our attention because it is a, an amplified version of what's already happening with surveillance cameras and stoplight photography and ATM cameras and the cameras that police have to wear in a lot of cities. We can amalgamate that stuff and draw some conclusions, but this is kind of like all of that together. And there's a God's eye view perspective that makes it seem a lot more serious. Most people do not have satellites. Most people do not have planes. Whereas if the cops are using surveillance cameras, well, we've kind of got cameras too. So it seems like a one for one trade off. This is something that seems to take the surveillance game up a notch. And again, it's something that through the right lens, looks pretty good. It's something that could conceivably prevent a lot of crime, could lead to a lot of perpetrators of crimes getting captured, getting some people who legitimately need to be off the street, get them off the street so they cannot continue to victimize other people. But because of numerous different things, different things that have happened in the news, different overwhelming attitudes toward authority and government and police in particular, Our perspective on this is not ultra clear. It's not something that we look at and just look at the facts and say, oh, surveillance, oh, this will help them do X, Y, and Z. This is something where what we see is an entity that has consistently and persistently been abusive to certain groups of people and has consistently and persistently taken advantage of a whole lot of the powers that they have been offered, that they have been given, with or without the consent of the citizenry. And so we've got the confluence of things like Edward Snowden's revelations about the NSA and WikiLeaks documents showing how our military has done really horrifying and illegal things overseas and how our surveillance infrastructure and information is not always shared with the public. And a lot of that stuff is censored and kept away from even the politicians who are the only ones who would have the power to get rid of it. We have increasing indications of the CIA's consistent overstepping, not just around the world, but also within U.S. borders. And we have the abuse at ground level from these police directly, very conveniently experiencing errors with their body cams as soon as they do something horrible, uh, particularly to people of color within the United States. There have been so many people killed brutally by police officers recently seemingly without provocation in many cases, or in many more cases with provocation that should not lead to the death of somebody who is unarmed and someone who you are supposed to protect being a cop. All of these things have combined to the impression that these people in power don't need more power. If we give them more power, they will use it to hurt us. They will use it to abuse us and to push us down somehow. And this may or may not be the case. It could be that these people who are using this surveillance really do have the best of intentions. And these are not those people. But because of these oversteps and abuses that have been perpetrated by other people who are part of that overclass of the security industry and the governmental industry, the bureaucracy, the the executive part of the bureaucracy, 
we tend to view anything done by anybody who's even vaguely within those ranks as something that we need to be suspicious of. And so this, for all we know, could be a really legitimate, positive use of this type of technology. But because our perception has been swayed by all of these other things, we have an inherent bias against it in most cases and in most cities around the United States. This particular instance is really interesting because police are only really vaguely associated with things like the military and with the CIA and with politicians and other groups that we don't trust who are all part of this kind of amorphic group of people in charge who we don't really trust. But when somebody does a really good job of altering our perception about one of these groups, if they do a good enough job, some of that overlaps with these analogous groups, these analogous entities as well. And so if you do a good enough job making people generally mistrust politicians, then some of that will overwash into these groups that are related but not necessarily the same thing, like the police, like the military, like spy agencies. And that's a really powerful thing if you think about it. It's immensely powerful being able to control the labels that are applied to others because it allows us to really shape their story. It allows us to shape the overarching narrative about that group and about adjacent groups as well. We see this a lot in politics, being able to enhance the perception that one's political opponent is a bigot, for example, means that anything that person does from that point forward will be seen through that lens, through the lens of something a bigot would do. If the title stays, at least, if the smear campaign stays, or if it's true enough that they can consistently show that this is the case, then it will stick around. Then it's something that will impact them potentially forever if that label sticks. You could do the same with your political opponent being soft on crime or being able to label them as crazy or selfish or weak or low energy. I think you can think of examples for all of these where somebody has tried to label their opponent as something, usually a label that has maybe a grain of truth or a label that's an amplified version of what's really happening or a negative slanted version of something that's actually happening. And then that filters everything that person does forever through that lens sometimes positively for that politician doing the labeling, and sometimes not quite so positively. Arguably, labeling your political opponent as crazy is as harmful as it is potentially beneficial. And I'm not just talking about the potential unfortunate byproducts for the mental health industry and people with legitimate neurological conditions. If you label somebody crazy, them acting crazy then is normalized to a certain degree. Whereas if they did not have that label, them doing that thing would stand out a little bit more. It would stand out as something that means they actually have beliefs about something, as opposed to it just being something that fits within their overarching crazy antics. Whatever the case though, this is apparently something that's effective enough that people continue to do it. Watch for this every election season and you'll see it happen and you can kind of get your thumb on the overarching narrative that one politician is trying to paint about the other politician so that they can control their story by using these types of labels. But this controlling of narratives by using labels isn't just something that happens in highly contentious areas like politics. We do this to ourselves and to our friends and family all the time as well. We say that we're introverts, or we're ENTJs, or we are Virgos. Maybe we're somewhere on the Asperger's scale, or we have ADHD. These are all labels that attempt to define a complex collection of attributes, and in doing so, it flattens the people who maybe mostly fit inside a particular mold. We can be introverts with extroverted tendencies, maybe, but once we have applied this type of baseline to ourselves or to somebody else, Anything that we do to deviate from that baseline makes us deviants. It makes us abnormal according to this standard that has been set for us. And this is a really important concept to understand for a lot of different areas of life. When you are trying to target a certain demographic with a particular product or service, what you do is flatten groups of people into labelable classes so that then you can target them as, as clumps, as clusters of people. These people are not the same, but they are the same enough 
that they share certain attributes that you're looking for in a potential customer. So when you use a term like big sky families, what that tends to mean is people who live in like Montana or Wyoming, maybe Oregon, and you have a particular type of house, you have a particular type of lifestyle, maybe you have a little bit more space, you spend more time outdoors, you drive a particular type of car or a truck. Maybe you tend to have a certain type of pet or pets. Maybe you tend to have a certain number of children. There's a lot of different attributes that go into these different demographic labels. And they're useful in that they do allow you to cluster people who have certain shared traits. But common usage beyond that, like the aforementioned introvert or the Myers-Briggs personality labels like ENTJ, The idea that there's only 16 types of people in the world is laughably ridiculous, and yet these are things that we put a great deal of stock in. Why? Well, because they define something about us, potentially, ostensibly. (laughs) Supposedly, they, they say something very deep and meaningful about us, and maybe they do. Maybe they allow us to put a label on something that we kind of had a an idea about, but we'd never acknowledged completely. And being able to do that can be liberating. At the same time, if you see yourself as a complete individual with lots of weird angles and textures and details that cannot be fully described by four different letters put into a particular order, this type of label can be incredibly limiting. It can be a cookie cutter that cuts off all the interesting bits. And once we have these labels in place, as I mentioned before, we suddenly have a baseline for everything that we do. And so if you are labeled an introvert, but you like to go to parties or have conversations regularly, suddenly you are a strange introvert. Whereas if you simply like to go to parties and talk to people to begin with, and you do not have this introverted label, well, you're not strange at all. That's a completely normal thing. And setting these types of baselines is all about establishing a default or an average or a normal And the idea of a normal is an incredibly insidious concept. I'm fairly certain that there's never been an absolutely normal anything. Normality is a concept that seeks to pull fringe groups or fringe people from the outskirts towards the middle. It is something that tries to guilt people or shame people into coming under a shared label umbrella. The idea of small, medium, and large in the measurements for our clothing, for example, is a really strange way to gauge people. Because although it's three different sizes, that's much better than having just one size for everybody to try to fit into. For most people who wear a medium size something, a medium size shirt, it doesn't fit them perfectly. And Mediums vary from brand to brand and shirt style to shirt style. And so the concept of medium in and to itself isn't even a consistent label. And yet it's something that identifies an average point. And so we are either a little too big for medium or a little too small for medium or a little too big or small in our arms or our torsos or our neck size for medium. And as a result, we are suddenly imperfect by the standard of this immense average that nobody quite lives up to. Normal in that way is a whole lot like best. There's no absolute best by every single possible standard of anything. You cannot say this is the best country in the world or this is the best type of food in the world because there's far too many properties to take into account. It's not measurable. You could say this is the saltiest food in the entire world because that's something that you can quantifiably prove. You can actually show that it has the most salt per density of food or something like that. You can measure that. But you cannot say what the best food is because there's far too many standards and that's something that is different to everybody based on their taste or based on whatever else you're measuring it by. And the same is true with normal. Normal is such a vague, nebulous term that is useless, and yet we use it as a standard for so many different things. We may not aspire to be normal using that particular word, but we may aspire to be a good ENTJ, or a good introvert, or a good Virgo. 
we might aspire to be an excellent normal of these different labels that we apply to ourselves or have applied to us. And as a result, we might try to cram ourselves into a tiny little box that is nowhere near us shaped. If you start looking for these types of labels, for these normalizations, these creation of averages and defaults, you'll see them everywhere. And you'll also see people trying to control them, whether it's politicians shouting at each other trying to get your vote, or whether it's brands trying to compare themselves to others or trying to show that you fit within their group and they will help you better represent yourself as a good whatever. And this is all about controlling that narrative. It's about controlling our bias towards something. And these are all examples of us being dragged around by our biases, being controlled by the storyline that is the consequence of our perception of something. Whether it's us, or whether it's politics, or whether it's the brand of soap that we use, our perception of these things are powerful, and our perception of ourself and where we fit is also powerful. Some of these biases, some of these stories that we tell ourselves, and, and some of the lenses through which we view the world are kind of inherited. We have certain biases toward the standards and practices and traditions that we grow up with, for example, very typically, or, or against them in some cases as well. There's also kind of latent psychological biases that a lot of us have, like the bias toward not wanting to lose something. It's, it's been shown over and over again in experiments that we would much rather never have something than to have something that we already have taken away. The idea of losing something is psychologically cumbersome for us. So some of these biases are essentially baked in, and we can change those over time if we want to, if we pay attention to them. We can kind of customize our biases as much as possible, but a lot of them are trained into us over time by our parents, by our families, by our cultures, by our educators, by these brands that want us to identify with the product or service that they're providing, with our governments, with our religions. There's a lot of different groups out there that are vying to shape our world for us. And one of the ways that they do this is by telling a particular story and shaping that narrative, by sanding down our lenses so that the light is warped a very specific way, so that we see the world the way that they do, or a way that is convenient for us to see it based on what they want from us. A lot of what surrounds us day to day, in conversation, in the media, in everything going on around us, are attempts to adjust our perceptions and biases. And this is the result of the economy in which we live, the, the global economy that we are all part of, or at the very least adjacent to. But it's also the result of the idea economy that we've adopted as a global human society. Your philosophy facing off against mine, your religion facing off against that other guy's, etc. And some of these arguments and competitions are fairly blatant, but the ones that tend to be the most influential over time are the ones that are largely invisible. These are the ones that shape our perception of something invisibly, so that when an opportunity to change our mind arises, or when we're deciding on a new brand of fabric softener, or when we go to the polls after a bad news week for our typical political party, we're more likely to be swayed by what we see and to have the data that we are taking in filtered through a very subtly and carefully altered perception. Again, you can start to notice some of these things if you really pay attention, but when I say subtle and invisible, in a lot of cases these things really are. It's the, the use of certain keywords, it's the use of certain colors and typefaces in advertisements, in posters, in websites. It's the use of subtle background music. There's a lot of really incredible design and interface and audio and contextual and textual ways to manipulate people. And I'm, I'm not talking about like subliminal messages or something far out like that. I'm talking about really well understood ways to adjust people's perception of certain things and to adjust how you feel about it. By adjusting the warm tones in the lighting in a supermarket, you can increase the perception that this is a higher-end supermarket compared to that other one down the street, which has 90% of the same products, 
but this one will be a little bit more expensive and have a few of those higher end ones and you indicate that partially by the tonality of the lighting that you provide. Look around the mid-range to higher end restaurants and even fast food places and you'll realize that a lot more of them use beiges and earth tones and slightly washed out colors, very few primary colors. Whereas the less expensive lower end ones will use more primary colors. They'll use a lot more yellow, a lot more red. These are colors that tend to make us feel hungrier. But they're also colors that tend to indicate a certain thriftiness. And some of these tricks are psychological. Yellow and red making us hungrier are things that we've realized after doing a whole lot of study on color theory and psychology. Whereas things like beiges and earth tones indicating Higher end food establishments are things that are no doubt societal. Colors mean very different things from society to society because of cultural tradition, because of a particular brand doing really well, and then their colors being associated with a certain demographic. There's a lot of different things that tie into this, but these are all things that are used and they change over time. So you really have to pay attention if you want to keep up with what's what, but you don't need to know about all of them to notice them over time and to at least associatively understand what's happening, even if you don't know exactly what they're going for. These are all powerful things to know about if you want to use them to control your own life. You can adjust your own perception in order to save money or to enjoy a lifestyle that costs you less, for example. If you set your average, if you set your default setting to a lower cost of living type of lifestyle, fewer expenses, going out less, but you're able to establish certain luxuries within that. Taking a walk, playing guitar, taking more time to paint or to draw rather than working more to earn more money. These are all things that you can do to adjust your perception of a luxurious lifestyle. This allows you then over time to not require a high-end meal to enjoy your food or an expensive car to enjoy a road trip. If your standards are set high to begin with, see what you can do to slowly change those standards, to change that default, to adjust your perception and your bias in favor of something a little bit lower. That way, when you do have an incredibly fancy dinner, you appreciate it even more, but you don't expect it, and you can enjoy things that once would have been below average. Like so many things, though, as useful as this can be in your own hands when applied to your own life, this is also something that can be an incredibly subtle weapon of sorts against us if we allow it to be. Something that will control the way that we see things and control the way then that we react as a result to the things that are happening in our world and to the people and things around us. The best way to defend against being swayed in this way is to really train yourself to be aware when it's happening. When you notice a politician doing it, trying to control the storyline of their opponent by using certain labels or a consistent string of stories that point in a certain direction, a brand that's cherry picking data or using certain wording or certain coloration to define themselves or to define their competition or to define you to show why you should be buying their stuff, it's unlikely that any of us could ever be aware of every bit of bias and alteration of perception that is going on around us and that people are trying to use against us. It's just impossible. There's so much of it. And frankly, a lot of it is probably being done casually or passively by people who are just really good at shaping conversations. But by setting realistic baselines for yourself and controlling as much as possible your own adjustment knobs, you can make daily fulfillment, whatever that happens to mean for you, a whole lot more likely. And you can block out a lot of at least the most blatant potential manipulations out there, which allows you to see the world a little bit more clearly, a little bit more like it actually is, as opposed to through the lens of somebody who is trying to make you see the world in a certain way. So the standard caveat for when I promote certain companies or products or whatnot, I do not tend to take on as sponsors companies that I do not use myself. 
And that's part of why I'm so happy to have these two sponsors as fairly consistent ones over the past several episodes. The first one is HostGator, which is the hosting company that I've been using for years and years. They have a great assortment of different plans and options and price points for different people trying to accomplish different things, whether you just want to start up a WordPress blog or if you want to run a great big company for lots of different groups, lots of different websites, lots of different people, they have something for you. I have been a very happy user of their reseller plan for a great deal of time now. And I enthusiastically recommend them any opportunity I get. It's just that now when I recommend them, I also have the chance of helping to support the podcast. So if you are looking for some type of hosting service, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to hostgator.com slash LKT. And not only does that help support the show if you sign up, it also nets you a substantial discount. I think it's something like 35 to 60% or something off of their normal prices. So you benefit by getting a great deal and great service. They benefit by getting a new customer and the show benefits as well by getting a referrer fee. And the other sponsor for this episode is Audible. If you have not started listening to audiobooks yet, but you're listening to podcasts, I highly suggest it. I have been thoroughly enjoying integrating audiobooks into my routine. I still truly enjoy reading paperback books and books on my Kindle, but audiobooks have their own special charm because I can listen to them on road trips or while taking my daily walks or while I'm cooking as well, which has been a whole lot of fun. And something that I've found to be a lot of fun while having Audible as a sponsor is recommending books that you can get from them. And if you want to take them for a trial run, you can go to audibletrial.com slash LKT and you will get a free month of Audible and you will get a free audiobook of your choice, which is a really good deal because it's free. And if you don't enjoy it, you can always cancel, which is really easy to do. I suspect that, like me, you will probably enjoy the service and want to stick around, but you do not have to. Either way, the show still benefits and you still benefit, and Audible has the chance to try to win you over. So again, it's win, win, win. And I would love to recommend a couple of books for you today. Typically, I recommend one book per show, but I wanted to do two this time because they're kind of connected. The first is a nonfiction book called Overcomplicated by Samuel Arbsman. And Overcomplicated is essentially an entire book about the problems that we are going to face very soon as a result of what's happening with technology, where essentially a lot of the things that we use every day, no one person understands how to make any of these things or how to repair any of these things. We require great big corporations, great big groups of people to put together these increasingly complex things. And the next step and something that's happening already is that we have machines building other machines and developing and evolving and iterating other machines, which means that the only thing that will understand these machines fully is other machines that we don't fully understand. And so throughout the book, he approaches this from a lot of different angles and shows some of the benefits of this, but also a lot of the potential catastrophes that we might stumble into. So it's a whole lot of fun <laughs> to wade through all of these potential death traps for humanity and also just casual inconveniences that we'll probably be encountering in the near future, if not already. The second book that I wanted to recommend is something that I read many years ago, but it seemed relevant to that book. This one is fiction. And it's by one of my favorite fiction authors, Dave Eggers. The book is entitled The Circle. And Dave Eggers is not a science fiction author, but this is one of the better pieces of science fiction I've ever read. It's not science fiction as in spaceships and lasers science fiction. It's science fiction as in it essentially takes place today. And it takes place in a company called The Circle, which is kind of a Facebook plus Google plus Amazon type of company. And the main character is kind of navigating her way through this company as it evolves and becomes more integrated in society and becomes more technologically sophisticated. And you get to kind of watch as the technology informs the philosophy of society and security and privacy and sharing. And it, it really is immensely satisfying and horrifying satire. Is, is probably the best way to describe the circle. It's incredibly well written. 
It's really, really entertaining. It's a great page turner. It is laugh out loud funny at times. There are times when you're reading it and thinking, oh my God, the future is so cool. All of these things are coming or they're happening right now. That is so amazing. I want to live in that world. And then you turn the page and you're like, oh my God, no. So it, it really kind of drags you up, down, and all around and in all directions. And so as a result, I, I definitely recommend that. Maybe in tandem with Overcomplicated. So a fiction and a nonfiction recommendation that will get you thinking about technology in different ways. Both of these books are available on Audible. So if you wanted, you could sign up at audibletrial.com LKT. If you're already on Audible, you can also get it that way. When I had a couple people ask after the last several episodes where I've been giving book recommendations how they can still help contribute to the show by getting these books even if they don't want audiobooks or they already use Audible or something along those lines. So if you go to letsknowthings.com, you can see in the little contribute section there on the main page that if you click that link, it will take you to Amazon. You can find these books as ebooks or paperbacks or whatever, and I will get a small percentage of that sale. It won't cost you anything additional. It'll just give me a small referrer fee. So that's another thing to consider as well. But I particularly loved these books as audiobooks. So if you have not made audiobooks a part of your life yet and tried Audible, I definitely recommend giving the audibletrial.com slash LKT route a shot. So signing up with HostGator or giving that Audible trial a shot are two ways that you can help support the show. You can also contribute directly if you'd like. If you go to letsknowthings.com, you, there's a few different options of links you can click so that you can contribute a dollar an episode if you'd like. You could do more than that too if you would care to, but a dollar an episode would be absolutely amazing. You can also contribute by clicking on that aforementioned Amazon link and doing your Amazon shopping through that link so that I'll get that referrer fee. And you can also contribute by buying one of my books if any of them seem appealing to you. You can find my complete list of books at colin.io. Another way to contribute is to go to iTunes and give some stars and leave a review for the show. That helps bring new people in, as does sharing the show with a friend or your family or your social network. All of these things are very, very helpful, and I truly appreciate them. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsknowthings.com, and you can also, on that site, sign up for the LKT newsletter, which comes out every Monday. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com. You can find my YouTube show at considerthis.io. You can find me pretty much everywhere on social media at Colin is my name, and you can find Let's Know Things on Instagram and Facebook at Let's Know Things. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. 